Now, let's hear how Christ's death is good news to us. Uh, you might ask, um, how is someone's death, especially an excruciating and shameful death, good news? Back in Paul's day, to both the Jews and the Gentiles, the cross was considered the furthest thing from good news. Going back to our passage for today, our passage, uh, in our passage it states, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Why was Christ crucified a stumbling block? Okay, a scandalon in New Testament Greek. Scandalon means that which causes offense, that which arouses opposition. So why was the cross so scandalous, so offensive to the Jews? Well, I think the life of Paul, formerly Saul, can shed some light on this. Saul, before he became a Christian, vehemently persecuted Christians. Why did this top student under Rabbi Gamaliel the Elder want to so zealously eradicate all Christians, the Christian faith. I'm convinced that it was because of the cross. You see, the cross was reserved for the worst of criminals, and it was the most shameful way to die. In biblical times, it was a four-letter word, a scandalous word. It was a curse. In Deuteronomy verse 21, uh, verse 20, uh, sorry, chapter 21, uh, verse 23 says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. For a good Jew like Paul to believe that the Jewish Messiah could hang and die on a cross that is being accursed by God was scandalous. That is why Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, wanted to destroy anyone who had the audacity to propagate this blasphemy. But what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus as he was going to persecute Christians? He had a 180 degree revelation. He was given by the risen Lord a completely different understanding of the cross. He had a complete paradigm shift. The cross, which he hated so violently, now became something he would embrace, he would love, he would boast about, and even die for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 of a reading, verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing uh, foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's good news. You see, the cross is good news. His death is the gospel. Uh, if you can turn with me, if everyone would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Please turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is a good verse to memorize. 2 Corinthians is after 1 Corinthians. Um, it says here, God made him who had no sin to be sin. For us, okay, this is speaking about Jesus, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In this passage, we see uh, what we call imputation. An imputation. Christ's righteousness is imputed on us. And amazingly, our sin is put on Jesus, is imputed on Jesus. Because of our sin, on the cross, Jesus became sin. And that is why on the cross, Jesus cries out in the most chilling scream ever, something that I could never do justice, okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken in the New Testament Greek is uh, egatelepo, and egatelepo uh, means to forsake, to abandon, or to desert. Because the Father has an eternal and perfect relationship with the Son, it would be unimaginable to have this perfect relationship cut off. If you understand the Trinity, uh, you'll understand how amazing this is. Just imagine you have an, a mutual, perfect relationship with your, your parents. 
Just imagine how much you would love each other. Even more so than that, God loved His Son, and the Son loved the Father. The Father per had a perfect relationship with the Son, and He eternally loves His Son, and His Son perfectly loves His Father. But because God is set apart from sin, the Father had to forsake His Son. The Father had to abandon His Son. The Father had to desert His Son, whom He loved with his, all His heart, with all His soul, with all His mind, and with all His strength. Just imagine how painful it must have been for the Father to desert His Son. And just imagine how painful it must have been for the Son to be abandoned by His Father whom He loved, whom He obeyed and trusted perfectly. As excruciating as the pain, the physical pain of the cross might have, must have been, more hellish than the spikes that went into his hands, his wrists, and his feet, was this very abandonment of his Father. Because Jesus Christ had become sin. And that is why on the cross, Jesus cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the cross, as Jesus hung there, on the cross, on the tree, Jesus became a cursed object. The Holy Father could not help but look away from his son whom he loved because he had become the most filthy, the most putrid, disgusting abomination. But, however, there is good news here. You see? On the cross, there is good news. Do you remember what Jesus Christ said while he was on the cross? As Jesus breathed his last, and just before he gave up his spirit, he said, to tell us die, which means it is done, it is completed. Jesus had fully, completely, 100% paid for our sins on the cross once and for all. And that is why the curtain in the temple, if you recall, the curtain separated sinful men from holy God. That curtain was ripped, was torn from top to bottom, signifying that we can now enter with confidence into the holy of holies. We can now have a right relationship with the Father. And through that torn body of Christ, we can now receive the love of God. How great the love of the Father, that Christ, that God, in Christ, would die for us filthy, wretched, depraved sinners so that we can be the righteousness of God. In Romans, it says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God for his amazing plan. And praise God that Jesus did not stay in the grave. No, he rose again. Defeating death so that he can give us the victory over death for those who believe in Jesus Christ. That is why his life, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and Jesus' resurrection is good news. In conclusion, I'd like to sum up my points. I'd like to give you two points I hope that you will take from uh, my sermon. Number one, in order for the good news to be good news, we must hear the bad news first. Secondly, the good news comes from Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. So, when we hear the bad news first, we naturally respond in repentance to the bad news and we rest and we receive the good news because Christ has saved us. And that good news is Christ saving us through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And as a result, we, out of gratitude and thanksgiving, bear fruit, good works driven by the good news of the gospel. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to a church that is fully committed to Christ, his gospel, and his people. We have heard the law, 
but we have heard the gospel. So we thank you for the glorious good news of what you have done for us through your Son, reconciling sinful man to a holy, righteous God. Now, by the Holy Spirit, may we repent and believe the good news. May we produce fruit in line with the gospel. May we live in a manner worthy of one who believes in the gospel. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.